Welcome to the Futurati Podcast. Any member of the Futurati is somebody who believes in the power of the future. We know there's a better world ahead, and we indeed have the power to make it so. In our podcast, we talk to the best minds in the world about the most urgent problems facing mankind today, and we hope you learn as much from them as we do. I'm Thomas Fry, a professional futurist and keynote speaker. And I'm Trent Fowler, a machine learning engineer and author. Thank you for joining us. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for listening to the Futurati podcast. Tonight, we're joined by Bob Cook and Konstantinos Mekanatsidis. Dr. Cook is professor of quantum foundations, logics, and structures, and is well known for his work on quantum natural language processing and the applications of category theory. He is also science advisor to Cambridge Quantum Computing. Konstantinos is a former physicist who works with uh, Dr. Cook on applying quantum computing to problems in natural language processing and in various other domains. If you enjoy this interview, please don't forget to like the episode and subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to check out our website, futuratipodcast.com. Bob and Constantinos, thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thank Hello. you. Glad to be here. Could we hear a little bit about your respective backgrounds? I guess we'll just start with Bob. So, yes, I mean, I'll, I'll try to keep this short. So, I mean... Uh, I started off as a physicist in quantum foundations for my PhD. Then I was unemployed. Then I rebranded myself as a category theoretician logician. Uh, I ended up in the computer science department in Oxford as a postdoc, although technically I was paid by Cambridge, right. but I was in Oxford. <laughs> and uh, I ended up being there 20 years, so I became full professor there. Uh, we built a very big group there, which was, which was 50 people a couple of months ago. Uh, around New Year this year, I left university. Well, not really leaving, but uh, I um, became chief scientist of Cambridge Quantum, which both includes a company-wide role. But at the same time, I got a team which I could build in Oxford. Right. We are now, and we're now in short time, like 20, 30 people there. And our focus is mainly, well, at the moment, this officially quantum natural language processing, but Basically, we aim to revolutionize AI. <laughs> well, fantastic. That's, that's kind of the big plan. That's the big plan. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm sure we'll have plenty of time to talk about quantum AI. And, and Constantinos, how about yourself? Yeah. Right. I am. I started as a physicist too. Uh, I still consider myself to be one. And uh, I did my PhD in condensed matter physics. Um, my motivation was to understand emergent phenomena. And then a specific emergent phenomenon, to cut a long story short, that I was interested in was uh, the mind. How does it arise from the brain? And then I ended up working with Bob in Oxford. <laughs> we also share a music taste, which helps. <laughs> and Very nice. uh, here, here we are. Here we are. I st we started working part time, actually, on, on quantum NLP. We designed the first ever experiment to run on actual quantum hardware. Uh, you'll hear about this a bit later, I guess. Yeah. And uh, and then we suddenly grew very fast with Cambridge Quantum Computing. Very nice. So it grew slowly and then all at once. Uh, the company in total, the company in total is now about three hundred forty people. Yeah. That's quite a lot. That's that's pretty big. I, I it wasn't holding in my head that there were that many people. What, what are the different teams doing? I mean, like, what are the three hundred forty people doing? Uh, so, so a big chunk of that are people based in the U.S. like building hardware. Okay. That's the Honeywell. That's the Honeywell part. Uh, then, then the there are mainly four teams in the U.K. Uh, one based in Cambridge, which is headed by Ross Duncan, who is the person who I came up with the X calculus with in 2008. So the X calculus is this graphical game, which is now becoming more and more popular in quantum computing. And which is a, a major part of our book, my book with Alex Kissinger. So, so and Ross is heading the software at CQC. Then there is a quantum machine learning team in London, and there's also a quant also a quantum crypto team in London, and then the fourth team that's us in Oxford. Okay, so so it's a lot there's of also smaller teams in Japan and stuff. Very interesting. So, so you guys are just working on different domains and and applying quantum computing to to different things. Yeah, yeah. I mean. I mean I mean, our team, we are not just solely quantum. We also use quantum models, which we probably in shorter term will implement classically. 
because of lack of uh, sufficiently powerful hardware. Okay. So I got a bit of a history in classical NLP too. So are you, uh, when, when Google announced that they had created a quantum uh, crystal, um, is, is that fall within your domain of expertise or not? You mean the time crystal? Yes, the time crystal. Right. What's up with that? Right. This is like, uh, this is, I would say, on the domain of condensed matter and, and quantum simulation. Uh, it would be closer to what the quantum chemistry team does in CQC. Okay. What, they, uh, what, can you tell us a little bit about that state of matter? I mean, I heard it's a, it's a different state of matter and that's, that's sort of evocative. So what, what's the skinny on right. that? So it's, it's a combination of Floquet systems and quantum glasses. So the first thing I said refers to systems that are periodically driven externally. So, uh, there is some laser, for example, that drives it with some modulation, which is constant, of constant frequency. And then um, a glass or a many body localized state is uh, something that um, arises, is a collective state that arises in disordered material. Uh, something that is dirty, has, has non-uniformity. And, and, and so, um, for example, these materials show things like a very slow propagation of quantum information between regions. Okay. Right. So when you combine these two elements, many body localization and Floquet systems, then you get what they call uh, a time crystal, a quantum time crystal, which is a state which breaks something that is called a spontaneous time symmetry. Mm -hmm. And so um, there are states that are labeled by quantum numbers that have to do with uh, the frequency of the external drive and multiples of it. That's as far as I understand it for the, the little time I gave to reading it. It has also a very interesting history that goes back to Frank Wilczek. But that history has a lot of uh, controversy and people arguing what how it actually is defined, the time crystal. Because the way he defined it at first, it was kind of like a perpetual motion machine. Okay. Um, and now how we how the condensed matter physicists define it is a bit different. You need this external driving. I see. Um, but yeah, it's just super interesting physics. And what Google did was actually simulate one. Because, uh, you know, the first thing you do as a physicist is you try to simulate it on, a, on your classical computer. And then if you're Google and you have a quantum computer or some other company, like us, for example, well, then you can try to use the actual quantum computers to see these physical phenomena not just simulate them classically or, or directly simulated with nature herself, which is as an experimentalist in the lab, right. which is the most direct thing you can do, right? Right. Is, right. The, way, the way it's, oh, sorry. Yeah, do you have any examples of how this might be used in the future? Not really. Uh, honestly, <laughs> I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Okay, I don't know. I will uh, randomly say sensors or something. Sensors, <laughs> time crystal sensors. Okay. I'd say the something way, that detects frequencies. The way which is related to what we do is that most of the time, when people talk about simulation with quantum computers, they talk about quantum matter, like really substance, physical substance, which is quantum, which can be chemical, which can be materials like we were just, Constantinos was just talking about, but that's usually what's conceived as, okay, this is quantum stuff which we want, which is kind of quantum native, and we want to simulate on a quantum computer. The sort of angle we come from is that for quantum native stuff or stuff which naturally gets simulated on a quantum computer, you don't only have to look into physics. You can also look in other places. And uh, uh, like language is one of them. The way we model language, and, and this was before we actually were considering ever to put it on a quantum computer. This was just a matter of uh, combining meaning and linguistic structure. You end up with a quantum model, with something which looks exactly like a quantum model. So then automatically, you start to think, well, the natural place to implement such a thing is on a quantum computer. That's basically what we mean with, by quantum NLP. It's not like take standard NLP and speed it up. It's really come up with a, with a model of NLP, which, which basically looks like quantum formalism. And this is what we did in 2008, when we tried to combine linguistic structure, mainly grammar, with 
meaning, uh, which now these days are vector space representations, vector embeddings typically. Yeah, yeah. Well, l- let's just stick with that. So, uh, for the so the audience knows, I mean, the, the way semanticity is usually represented now is just with these distributed vector embeddings. So you just have this like complicated yes. vector that sort of isn't human readable, but it kind of represents the concept. And it's usually, as I understand it, it's usually calculated based on the words that are in the proximity of it. So you, you know a word by the, the company it keeps, basically. So that, that was a traditional way, but right. it was still sort of still somewhat transparent what was going on. Now it's much more trained and it's much less clear what they represent, but they work better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. so so is that just because of of the advancement of pre-trained models and, and the fact that the models have gotten a lot deeper and so it's just not clear what function it's implementing on the in, on the inside yeah it, 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 it's a lot of it's a lot of things combined lots of uh, engineering tricks to actually get better models also the sizes and the dimensions have become sm- smaller while still retaining the same uh, capabilities and, and 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 stuff like for us it doesn't really matter by the way an interesting thing is that so we were, I mean, conceptually, I was always thinking in this counting thing, like uh, you said, because it's kind of easy to think in that way, especially if you've got a physics training. But uh, when we then actually went and went to implement it on a quantum computer, we, well, then there that, that is a weird thing about a quantum computer, you know, the currently existing ones. People typically know that it's very hard to get information out of a quantum computer. Right, right. right. If there is a state in there, you can't just read it. You can't right. just read it. You have to do very complicated trickery to actually figure out what's inside. The computer can do a lot of things at the same time, but you can't get them out. Right. And so quantum algorithm is about doing a acrobacy to actually get something useful out. Now, as it turns out, it's also very hard to get something efficiently into a quantum computer. You can't just take like a bunch of classical data, like a vector representation, and then say, okay, let's turn this into quantum state. It doesn't work. And, and, and the only kind of efficient thing you can do today is, is basically to train a quantum circuit or something. So you get a circuit, which is the stuff you execute into your computer. You've got a bunch of variables and you start training them. And that's much, more, that's much closer to what actually the neural net people do now and the deep learning people do now. And it's because there's just no other way to get your data into the quantum computer, which is sort of a, an interesting paradigm. You are forced to do the same, basically. Interesting. Okay. So can you just describe how quantum natural language processing developed from the early work that you were doing? So initially there there was work I was doing with Steve Clark, who's who's now uh, the head of AI at uh, CQC. Before that, he was, uh, we go back to the Cambridge Oxford thing. He was first faculty in Oxford, then he was faculty in Cambridge. Then (laughs) then he went to DeepMind and now he's back at Cambridge Quantum in the Oxford team. (laughs) (laughs) This little circles going on. So, so there was him and there was a, uh, also a postdoc at a time, Ernest Chadrzadeh, and we all had a completely different background. So Steve's, Steve knew about these vector space models. He was one of the, he had an NLP, computational linguistic training, so he knew about that stuff. Uh, Ernest knew about uh, grammar, like and more recent models of grammar, like Lombic pre-groups and things like that, because she actually worked with Lombic. And I was at the, at the time, I was basically... Yeah, you know, developing this categorical quantum mechanics thing. I knew nothing about language or machine learning, really nothing, literally nothing. Uh, but then when I was talking, when we were talking together, then it was very easy to put... Uh, so so when, when you looked at these grammar structures from a category theoretic perspective, and especially from a perspective where you want to represent things diagrammatically, they looked exactly the same as teleportation diagrams in quantum physics, which were the things we developed this graphical language for in quantum mechanics. So grammar and this graphical language for quantum theory was exactly the same thing. And then what are the models in quantum theory? They're vector spaces, they're in the product spaces. Right. So you basically, so, so it was obviously where you're gonna put the two together. So okay. we basically just do the quantum mechanical formalism from this diagrammatic one, and we had a, a theory which combined meaning and grammar. So, so if I have the story correct, basically you developed a diagrammatic way of understanding specific quantum states, uh, uh, quantum teleportation in particular. Uh, uh, yeah. Meanwhile, this is all of quantum mechanics. Right. So right. we can, like this book is a full course on quantum theory, purely diagrammatical. Yeah, that and that's picture, picturing quantum processes. So yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for anybody who's listening yeah, yeah. to it later, it's uh, it's yeah, it's, it looks to be a really interesting book. It's a full blown course in quantum. Everything is there. 
Right. And it's all diagrammatic. And, and then you set up these diagrams and you notice that there was just this interesting isomorphism with diagrammatical representations of uh, grammar coming coming from exactly, other theories. Exactly. A specific, a specific, a specific sort, because uh, the person did a lot of different kind of formalisms for grammar was a, a guy called Jim Lombeck. Uh, he started in 56, his first paper, which was like a revolutionary at the time, but he did, he did other papers in 99, 2000. And the formalism he came up there, which is called pre-groups, they look exactly the same as the as the quantum diagrams. Okay. And so then you began to explore whether or not that it was more than just something suggestive. And it, and it turns out that actually you can, you can model, uh, you can model semantics with, with, uh, quantum representations. If, if it depends. So if you think, if you look at grammar d- during these pictures, it's, it's completely obvious what grammar does or language does. It just like feeds words into each other to sort of then let, let them interact to make produce the meaning of a sentence. So at that point, it's 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 very easy to see that you can use these diagrams as an algorithm to take meanings of words, for example, the meanings of words, and then let them interact via these wires to produce the meaning of a sentence. That's literally what we did initially. So how, the question we had was like, if you know the meanings of words, how do you calculate the meaning of a sentence? Or and also part of how do you even represent it? So and by just by just using these diagrams, that's exactly what we did. Well, could, could we talk a little bit more about that? Because, I mean, I'm not a linguist, but I, I did do some natural language processing work and I have an interest in languages. And it seems like if, I don't know, I, I feel like I would have heard about that if somebody had solved the problem of meaning so so crisply. I, I feel like s- some philosopher of language would have brought it to my attention. So, it, I mean, a funny thing happened. We were, This was on the cover of New Scientist. But then deep learning became big and everybody forgot about it. <laughs> <laughs> we got distracted. Well, then crypto, like crypto after this, that. This got a lot of attention at the time, 2008, 2009, 2010. Well, so, okay, here is the catch. Here is the catch. Here is why you didn't hear about it. It's not computable. No, I'm, I'm kidding. It, uh, <laughs> well, you're not too far off. So so, so to, to compose all these words and to actually represent these things so that they can properly interact, you sometimes need like... Uh, like in, in, in typical vector space representations, everybody has the same space. Mm-hmm. Everything lives in the same vector space. Now, to do these things properly, like a noun would live in a different space than an adjective and would live in a different space than a verb, and so on, a transitive verb, say. And the, the, the space in which the transitive verb lives has two subspaces corresponding to nouns where actually the object and the subject would come in. So suddenly the spaces are starting to become very big. Or um, if you do it naively, unmanageably big. That's the problem. So we were trying to implement these things and people did it successfully and they, they outperformed a lot of existing things, but it wasn't easy. There was a lot of sort of uh, management going on in how can we reduce the size, which tricks can we come up with? So it wasn't straightforward at all. Uh, and And, but, that, that's where, uh, then, if you stick it on a quantum computer, you got no problem whatsoever, because th- that's the way quantum systems compose anyway. Right, right. While on a classical machine, you use tensor products, and they, they, they explode exponentially. Mm-hmm. So that's the reason it didn't take off, because it was too expensive on a classical machine. That's so fa- people, oh. Yeah, so people are looking for, uh, put their finger, I mean, the business management people in the quantum world are looking for where, where do we make our return on investment? Where do we get our money coming out of all of this research that we're doing? Is, is the natural language processing the, the path to wealth and riches that everybody's looking for? Or will it be something else? So, so one of the things people, I mean, there's different, so it's not just a, uh, one answer there because one factor is when do you want your return? Do you want it in three years? Do you want it in 10 years? Do you want it in 20 years? That's a completely, and that changes things a lot on on, on what the answer would be. Uh, The shortest term, people expect that the return will come from simulation, like simulation of chemistry, simulation of materials, things like that. So that also means that the people, the the companies are now mostly invested, investing, have some connection to chemistry or materials or, or, or 
I mean, I know some, some, for example, CQC has a contract with an oil company for carbon capture technology and, and things like that. So it's all very chemical. And, and where we come in, we, like I said earlier, is that this sort of models we have, which combine meaning and grammar and lots of other stuff, they actually are quantum-like models. You want to stick them on a quantum computer. It's virtually impossible possible to scale them very big on a classical machine. So it, at, while on a quantum computer, it's, it's just like a, an evolution without to, to any exponential overheads or something like that. And in addition, there is proven quantum speed up on top of that, all that. So, so that's a place where people now get interested because it's an alternative to the physical substrate. It, where where the quantum computer could be very useful in the short term. And what what are some of the applications of quantum natural language processing specifically that you see down the line? I mean, I mean the I mean we we are basically still just starting to think about this literally. I mean we we the main focus we had the last year and a half is can we even do anything like that on an actual machine? And and we've been doing that. We've been scaling up. Now um, so so our model of language is not. It's, it's sort of a new thing I came up with a couple of years ago. It's not about words to sentence anymore. It's actually representing meaning of an entire text. Really? As, as, one, as one evolution. Yes, as one evolution. And it takes like a circuit shape. It's just one evolution, the meaning of an entire text. And the type of, the typical place where you would imagine a quantum algorithm to get you really big speed up. I mean, you couldn't represent this, this thing on a classical computer anyway, just to start. But then where you could actually get a really big speed up uh, is typically where you ask like a simple question about, about a big complicated text, like where you want the binary answer, but you need to know everything about the text. That's typically where quantum algorithms are really good at. So you could, you could actually ask, who killed blah, 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 murder investigation. I mean, this is just, a, I give a silly example, but that's typically the thing where you get a lot of advantage with your quantum algorithms. A simple question about a complicated, very entangled chunk of data. So, so it's able to represent the meaning over the entire text? Yes. How, how big a text? I mean, that depends on how big the quantum computer will be. <laughs> well, I'm just... So my first thought was, you know, like a like a novel, like a thousand page novel, something very dense that deals with a lot of themes. Like, what would it even mean to represent the meaning of it all at once as a single data structure? That can't... oh no no no, so it's an evol. Okay, that is a good, I understand where you come from. It's actually a, an evolving data structure. It's not a static one. So typically in a, in a, in a, in NLP, meanings are static. They don't change. So for example, GPT three doesn't know there has been COVID epidemic. Because it was trained right. before, right? So, so, so it doesn't evolve at all. Like this model specifically, actually evolves as the text progresses. It's a big circuit. Like something happens here, something happens there, something happens there, something happens there. You have different agents who may be interacting. New agents would come in, and the thing just evolves. So, and the meanings evolve as stuff happens. So, you can't really do this with vector spaces. Uh, you, you need to re, uh, use something that. Uh, Von Neumann invented when he invented quantum mechanics, which are called density matrices. <laughs> density matrices. <laughs> so a density matrix is a, is like an information theoretic structure on top of vector spaces. So and, kind, of, kind of what you're saying now is that if you if you have a traditional search engine and you have a quantum search engine, the quantum search engine can make sense out of much more. Um, uh, uh, kind of ob obtuse questions. Is that correct? Well, there, there's different kind of so, so for a search for a search problem, you you got a specific algorithm which is called Groover's algorithm. Right. Uh, and there you, you you're searching like, like one of of a few like label tokens into a big set, and you get like a quantum speed up for that. But uh. The sort of more interesting problems where you get even more speed up are typically like uh, you got a piece of data and you need to know, and then you do a computation on a computation your data and you need to know all the outcomes of your computation in order to, to ask a binary question okay. about your structure. And that's where quantum algorithms are typically giving you a lot of benefit. If you can come up with like, 
simple binary questions about huge amount of data, but where you need to know all the data. So typically what a quantum computer does is it, it represents everything at the same time. And typically this is a computation on, on, I don't know how many inputs. You do this all at once. In one shot, you do all the computations on all possible inputs. That's what you can do with a quantum computer. The problem is you can't just read it, but you can sometimes ask clever questions about all that data. And that's, that's kind of a, how quantum algorithms typically work. So in this case, this could be like a simple question about it. Now, other things which we, we are thinking about short term is, for example, summarization. Yes. Text summarization, things like anything where you actually take an entire text as input. So, um, well, I'm, I'm sort of confused because you said that uh, you can ask it a binary question, but so far the examples you've given are things like who murdered John and and asking it to summarize the text. So I, I'm yeah, not... I mean, that, that, that's, that, that's not binary, but I mean, there's maybe only three or five suspect, suspects, you know? Okay. Okay. So, so, so that's small enough. That's I mean, small. So what you can't ask is, what, what you can't ask is, for example, you take all this input and then you have this computation which does, takes all the input does in one shot all the computations at once for all possible input, you can't basically ask sort of, okay, what are these values? Okay, okay. You can't ask. Well, you can't, you can't typically not ask what is the value for this particular input, even that you can't do. Okay, but, but, but could I do something like, suppose I had a quantum computer of the future and I fed it every major book and paper written on justice in the past, well, I guess 1,000 years, 2,000 years, right? I mean, could I ask it, what are the different conceptions of this word and, and who held which one? Is that the sort of query that I could structure? Mm, can, you, can you say again? Like, so, so how, do, a word like justice, like how, do, how, does, how is this word usually used? How do people seem to, to use it? What do they seem to mean by it? And then how does it change over time? That kind of thing. Oh, I mean, I don't, I mean justice is a, is a case where which is ambiguous by default because justice can be like a department, justice can be like a, a moral, can be a lot of different things. And in that case, I think again that the quantum computer is very advantageous just to actually represent all these different possible interpretations. And these are actually experiments which we've done on classical machines, not quantum machines, many years ago. Like them, then you, you have such an ambiguous word, you bring this in a bigger compositional context, so using all these tensor interactions, and then the ambiguity vanishes because of the context. So that's kind of a different way of thinking about uh, the context defines the meaning. In this case, it's the context disambiguates the, the ambiguities. And I mean, I mean, you probably know that, but, but the, the failure, the failure probably of the symbolic approaches to NLP and language was that they never accounted for the ambiguities in language. They thought this is something exceptional. As it turns out, it's more the rule than the exception. Right, right, right. Um, you know, part of the reason I'm interested in this is because I, I talk a lot with the founders of the company Ought, and, and they are basically building a user interface on top of GPT-3, uh, the most advanced language models. And they, you, you can do things like have it brainstorm different uh, questions for you or find papers related to a concept, something like that. So when you're talking about this, you know, quantum language model of the future running on, on quantum hardware yet to be invented, it, it really excites me because that could ramp up the, the abilities of, of the tools they're building. Uh, probably, I mean, the, the way I think about this, if we're going to do things people are doing already, then I'm going to be very disappointed and bored. <laughs> you, would expect, <laughs> you, you, you would really expect with something so radically new that you can actually come up with that the thing, it's, the, the, the thing itself is going to tell you what's the natural thing to do with it. And this can be totally different things. So, so I mean, one of the things we are, we are working on now, too, are more general cognitive models, but not just a language, but, but like spatial representation and things like that. And we are trying to put them all in the same sort of quantum compositional context. And uh, we, we think that in that way, we can open the black box of uh, the black boxes, which you now have in most ML and AI systems. So that's, that's one for me, one of the big challenges to open up the boxes. Well, that seems like a natural place to go next. Why don't you talk to us about the cognitive models? Okay. Uh, so, the, so the way we started there initially was uh, the sort of um, protocol we have to combine, say, language and, 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 and grammatical structure is, is very abstract in a way. So it, it doesn't have to be vector space representations of meaning. It can pretty much be anything. 
So this can be representations of sp certain spaces of concepts which are much more natural and closer to our perception. So one thing we've worked with is the things uh, Garden Force, Peter Garden Force proposed at some point called conceptual spaces. In recent work, we basically just took physical space around us as a representation of meaning, which still makes sense from a long language perspective because a lot of word carries sort of a physical spatial content. Most prepositions like over, next, above, chasing, they, they all have physical spatial, spatial connotation and even a, a lot of standard words are, are sort of spatial metaphors in the way we use meanings and... and uh, like, a a, like so, expansive, the, the yeah, know. yes, yeah. There's uh, so many words which actually you can you can sort of relate back to space. Probably there is like some sort of a developmental evolutionary explanation for that. No, not probably, uh, very likely. Right, right, right. <laughs> but so, so space plays a very important way in 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 how we in general perceive meaning and stuff like that. Uh, so, so we made a model for that, and we are now playing around with that too. And it actually is exactly the same isomorphic structure again as the language, linguistic grammatical structure. And uh, we work with spaces like color space and, and taste and, and things like that. And we are now trying to put them all together and make them interact. And then again, since you're in quantum reality, you expect these things to be very entangled. There will, will be color, correlations possibly between color and, and taste. We'll take a banana, for example. When it's green, it's going to be bitter. When it's yellow, it's going to be sweet. When it's black, it's going to be soggy. And and so and, and uh, there are many correlations between all these different conceptual spaces. So that's how we're trying to build a more grounded meaning space, possibly for language, but also for like basically uh, rep representing cognitive phenomena, way we may. To some, to some extent, it's called kind of a virtual embodiment. Yeah, yeah. So does it have a way of modeling causality? Because I was thinking as you were talking about the correlations, like the green banana is bitter and the yellow one is sweet and the black one is mushy. You described them as correlations, but I would say those are causal relationships. There's a causal relationship between the state of the banana and, and the sort of phenomenological experience of it. So can your quantum models account for that kind of thing? So that's, that's very interesting because... Uh, I mean, there's a bit of a history for that in quantum foundations that people were trying to mimic, hoping to mimic like Pearl's framework yeah. for quantum state, for yeah. quantum things. Uh, to some extent, that was a failure. I mean, a lot of this work was actually done in my research group in Oxford and uh, by, by very close colleagues of me, like Rob Speckens and Matt Liefer. Uh, but, but we, and we did learn things from that. Like uh, we learned... How, like, say, you got you got a meaning, say a density matrix, and then you got another meaning. How do you update one meaning given another meaning? So, so that, that's much more basic than causality, even. Yeah. That, that's yeah. just the, the first place you start, that's just updating. And uh, Constantinos and I, we, we, we've got a paper there, which people are, are now starting to use here and there in experiments and things like that. But, and... Uh, I think it's a completely new theory to be developed, quantum causality. So one of our people, Robin Lawrence, did his PhD about that. And it's going to take time. But it's very interesting. I mean, there's nothing, I think, out there which uses... And this is not just about quantum. This is about vectors, uh, causality for vector spaces. It's, it's a non-trivial thing. Things don't extend straightforwardly from the classical case. They don't. So in the, in the past, we've had uh, several discussions about uh, the topic of quantum AI uh, with some people saying that uh, that doesn't really work very well for quantum computers. Um, and so we got into the, a lot of discussions about how quantum computers and traditional computers are going to be integrated together and they rely on each other. Is is that a better way of thinking about how this is going to evolve? I mean, that, that's what we are doing at the moment in our practical things. Like we, the, there is a, a Constantin can, can say there's this classical control computer which actually trains the quantum computer to some extent. Um, will they be able to stand alone on their own in the future without that? Well, 
there, there are quantum computers now being, I mean, one, 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 one of the very exciting architectures for a quantum computer is one which is being developed by PsyQuantum, which is the best funded quantum hardware company there in California. Uh, and so the sort of, so there is no such thing as a single quantum architecture. So most of the ones which exist now, they take a circuit model. So, so you, you have quantum circuits and you implement them. So the one which is in a, they're trying to build in California is called measurement-based quantum computing. Completely different beast. You don't apply operations one after another. You, you have some big states, some huge entangled state, and the only thing you do is measure. You measure, and then you can take your measurement outcome, you feed in a classical machine, and depending on the outcome, you decide what's your next measurement gonna be. So you got constant interaction between measurement and control, but you never apply like a process, an operation. You're just observing. This is a, a model called measurement-based quantum computing, and it has a lot of advantages because uh, uh, it, it's more, more fast, full tolerant and all that, but uh, there are that, such a, uh, yeah, actually such a thing exists in Vienna. In Vienna, they've built a few small. We're working with them in Vienna. We're doing experiments with them. On their op this is all optics. This optics they implement this in optics. Optics light is a fantastic thing, you know. Light reaches us from I don't know how many billion, whatever light years, and it's still it's still coherent. It, it, it's, right. it's so light is a really really good thing. <laughs> it stays <laughs> it stays the same. Like light the is a good is, thing. That's the tagline of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, light. I mean, the fact alone that we can actually see something that these things reaches our eyes and. and that it doesn't sort of all blurs away is an amazing thing. And the problem with all other, all other materials, quantum, is they, they just they vanish like nothing. They vanish in microseconds and stuff like that. Light just stays there, just goes on. So, so these people are trying to build this optical measurement-based quantum computer. Now, this is such a radically different design of a machine that whatever you're going to do with it is also going to be radically different. I mean, in principle, you can do everything you can on a normal computer. There's algorithms that you can translate, and, and um, but you'd exp but this would be such a radical, incredible thing. And it's 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 by def definition a hybrid. That's why I started to talk about it. It's by definition a hybrid because you do classical processing all the time to decide what you do next. Oh, that's fantastic. Um Quite a lot of what we discussed so far turns around this diagrammatic language that you've developed and, and this formalism for representing quantum states. And I, I'm interested in learning more about that, how it emerged out of category theory, and also some other places you might apply it. Because on the book jacket, you talk possibly about, well, I, th I think, biological systems or maybe economic systems, something like that. What are some of the other places we can we can apply? I this? mean, I already talked about it. Like I said, we, 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 we build the linguistic model of space and then all these concepts and things I was talking about. So, so obviously, they're there. So the, the way I got there is, is actually through von Neumann. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean you, you get everywhere through von Neumann. You know? yeah, yeah. But, but this is actually von Neumann's big failure. So von Neumann, when, uh, when he brought out his, his book on the quantum formalism using Hilbert space, that was in, uh, I think, 1932. He used Hilbert spaces. In 1935, he sort of declared Hilbert space as in vector spaces within a product cannot be the right formalism for quantum mechanics because I just use them because they were around and, and vector spaces are pretty much something you can stick anything in. I mean, that's that's pretty much what's happening now, by the way, in, in a lot of uh, NLP. Like, you can stick anything in a vector space. Uh, so he spent most of his career then then trying to figure out better quantum formalisms. In, in doing so, he invented, I don't know how many different new areas of mathematics and all that. Right. But, but none of them actually, so, so see star algebras, all that stuff, Neumann algebras, he came up with all that stuff. Uh, but none of this actually took over Hilbert space as a quantum formalism. And, and, and that's kind of where I came from. So as a, as, 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 as a student at school, like I actually didn't like quantum mechanics and I wanted to change the formalism. And then somebody told me, yeah, for Norman wants to do that too. And he failed. So good luck. <laughs> <laughs> but, but then there, there was a big history of a, a field which was called quantum logic. So this actually came out of Norman's attempts 
to come up with alternative formalisms. And lots of top mathematicians of the previous century were all involved in that. And uh, by the end of the previous century, it sort of became clear where, where all this formalism failed one way or another. The thing is they, they all came up with certain structures which maybe capture superposition and things like that. But so you take a structure, but they never they never really came up with a way to canonically combine two things into like like two separate systems into one. Like how do you describe the big system if you got two subsystems? It was they always had to go back to Hilder space to do that. They couldn't do this in whatever fancy structure they came up with. So so part of the idea of what we did and where the category theory came in and also where the diagrams came in was let's not worry about what structure, what way you have to compose them. Let's take it as a primitive. Let's start with a formalism where you say there is an operation of putting two systems together. And that's that's the basic, that's the number one uh, operation in your language. There's nothing else. So you just got a general theory of composing systems and then uh, as it turns out, by by making this a theory of processes, which is an idea which which goes back to the pre-Socratics, you know, you know the fights between Heraclitus and Parmenides and all that. They were talking yeah. about do we live in a world of processes or states? Yeah. So if you go to processes, which was also very much pushed by Whitehead, right? Uh, then actually you can use the structure of the processes to implicitly define the way systems compose and all that. And now. So somebody actually proposed this or in the same year as uh, von Neumann denounced his formalism was Schrödinger. But nobody never picked that up. This was some sort of, everybody knows about the cat, everybody knows about the equation and stuff. <laughs> but nobody knew about that, that statement of Schrödinger where he said, so everybody in quantum mechanics was typically obsessed with quantum measurement. The measurement is weird when you observe it's weird. Schrödinger said, no, 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 that's not it. It's when you put two systems together. That's where all the core content is. And the formalism we developed, the graphical formalism, is really kind of a realization of that program. I mean, when I was doing, I didn't know that Schrodinger had said that, but that's something you, you learn later. Uh, so, so the diagrams, why, why diagrams? So I've got two systems. I represent one system by a line. I represent the other system also by a line. What is the composite of two systems, two lines side by side? End of story. That's it. I know how to write down two systems. I, this, all these quantum logic people didn't know how to do that. Of course, I don't say what lives inside the line, but it doesn't actually matter. It turns out that, that there are simple ways, like uh, we do in our book. So then if you've got a state which is actually in the shape of a cup and an effect which is a state of a cap, then you actually already define your tensor to be exactly like the tensor product. That's all you need to do. So this can all be defined purely diagrammatically. I mean, I know this is purely... Uh, audio, so I can't right. that. <laughs> but that's all you need to do. So it's very easy to define like a tensor product like in quantum mechanics. It really means there is you got two systems and you can actually put a cups, connect them with a wire. That's all you need to say. And then you got like the behavior like a tensor in quantum mechanics. All you need to say. Well, I find that really interesting. How how can it not matter what's inside the system? I mean. It, it, are there no quantum systems that are inconciliant and that can't be combined in some way? Like, how, do, how does your diagram represent that or reason about that? So, so this 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 cup state basically represents a bell state. Um, it, I mean, it, it this is something which even exists in probability theory. Obviously, it means like I got two entities, two systems. I don't know what they are. I don't know what the properties are, but I know that whatever properties one has, the other one has two. So, say a twin, a twin. I, I give you the concept of a twin. You know, however, one one of the twins looks, the other one will look exactly the same. But I'm not saying anything more. Okay. So that's so, and and something like that would also be naturally described by a tensor, exactly the same. It's it's the same story, because uh, the, the same tensor product li lives in the category of stochastic maps. It even lives in the category of like sets and relations have this property because what I just described, uh, the twin, that's a, you can, you can, you have a twin relation. Twin, so you take two sets and basically you say, this is the relation where everything in set one is the same as in set two. You can just define this. You don't need vector space, you define these sets and relations if okay. you want to. Okay. And that's basically enough. You can prove that, that, Whatever structure you want to throw on top of it, you'll always end up with something like a tensor product. Always. 
So it. So it, we got in. We got into this discussion about um, the fact that nobody's actually created a periodic table of smells yet. Um, <laughs> being able to smell things. Um, it would that would that be something that a quantum computer would be good for analyzing? It's one of the classic Futurati podcast curveballs. I don't, I don't know analyzing, but it, we actually effectively have been looking into like building spaces of smells, and because th these are convex. The, if, if you follow Gar Garden Force program, they're all convex sets. All these spaces of concepts are convex sets, sets and convex sets very naturally uh, embed in, in in sort of quantum states. So it's indeed something you could represent easily. Whether you can figure it out. But there's some, the thing is, like the chemists with their quantum simulations, they've been doing this, they've been thinking about this since Feynman. Basically, Feynman suggested that we start to think about these things like a year ago, <laughs> literally. So there's, still, so there's still a long way to go. But, but it's what I said before, I expect the things these quantum computers will be good at are the things we are now not thinking about. Okay. That's yes. my See, as a, as a futurist, one of the, one of the things I do is I, I put together uh, roadmaps of anchor points in the future. We, uh -huh. we know that somebody's going to accomplish X or somebody's going to accomplish Y or accomplish Z. And so with quantum computing, we're trying to figure out exactly what are these anchor points in the future, because there's people who always want to be first. They want to be the they want to get their name on this climbing Mount Everest to accomplish this one little little task in the quantum world. And do you have a, a, a sense as what some of those might be? Uh, uh, I mean, I mean I'm, I've, I've got some, some intuition and hope, otherwise I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. And I generally think that, <laughs> that the quantum computer is going to take AI a lot further. So it's okay. going to actually give us a completely new generation of artificial intelligence, uh, which to use the modern words, which is more responsible, which is more transparent, which is ethically more justified, and, and which I expect to be also a lot more intelligent. <laughs> because okay. the current ones are, yeah, I mean, re bring it, so, so bringing reasoning back into AI, because reasoning kind of died in AI after the symbolic period. Now with ML, like the symbolic AI is gone and the two don't combine, the two don't combine well. You need to come up with a completely new way of, maybe discussed earlier a causality. I do believe that there is a theory out there of causality, which is not of the current symbolic kind and which will be completely compatible with learning methods and all that. So that's something we are gonna develop. Uh, and the same is true for like uh, lots of reasoning. So, so where, where do I can get the belief from so I'll go a little bit technical now. This, quant this diagrammatic quantum stuff, uh, some people have proved that anything you can, any equation you can derive in Hilbert space, you can derive just diagrammatically. So we've got a complete diagrammatic system. So we were able to re replace all the reasoning and whatever you can do with matrices and, and linear maps just by pictures. And that gives me the belief that we can also incorporate, probably we can use a lot of the stuff we did in the quantum, quantum side. We can also incorporate reasoning back within machine learning, AI, and all the things where they use vector space for. But we, we don't have to look at like all the old reasoning mechanisms, the sort of uh, propositional logics and things like that. We have to start much, it's much better to start with say this quantum formalism and the reasoning there. So that's why I've got a strong belief that we can do that. Yeah, let me add something that touches upon what you said before. Before you were talking about these cups, these bell states, these, these, these correlated entangled states, and how they the same structures appear somewhere else in probability theory, in sets and relations, right? And so all of this framework that we call category theory, which Bob developed together with, uh, well, in the context of quantum theory. Well, category theory, what, what does it do, right? The way I understand it is, it's like the, it's the mathematical language of formal analogy making, right? So you understand mappings between structures, 
but not just hand wavingly, like formally. You understand watertight analogies between mathematical structures. And this is powerful, right? Because if you if you can take a domain which has been studied like crazy, and you have and you discover formal mappings to other new domains, well, this is obviously powerful, right? Of course. So these things go both ways. Like when you start making analogies between language and quantum and and cognitive models, it doesn't only go one way in the sense that oh, we can use quantum computers to simulate language. Maybe quantum theory inspires us to make new models, right? To to do to to design novel models of cognition or AI. So this is a trivial point, but it needs to be appreciated that these things go both ways. I mean, in a way, in, in a way, that's what we did already by by saying like mapping language on 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 a, in first order mapping language on quantum. So and then, then and then we start to incorporate lots of stuff from quantum, and we found, for example, things like how do you model a relative program? Mm -hmm. So so I went in my quantum book and <laughs> picked something up, and that's how we model a relative program, and it worked. We did experiments, and it worked. So so yeah, I mean, I, th I think there's a, and and the thing which Constantino says goes a lot further, like, and that's that's really. So, so the thing with category theory is you can sort of talk about a single theory. Then you can talk about the theory of all theories and all that. And you can do the same analogies at, at higher order level. And that's that's kind of how I'm thinking now about incorporating the higher order mechanisms of, of, of our reason of quantum systems to actually get reasoning systems, new reasoning systems for AI. I, I'm curious as to how far that could be pushed. So, I mean, could category theory furnish a way of finding analogies that apply across all sorts of different fields? I mean, could, could you just do like enumerate all the different fields and then pair them up in, in tuples and then look for, look for mechanisms that are operative in this field and then see if there are mechanisms that are operative in the other fields and like 80% of them will be duds, but then you come up with that 20% that are just all these research fields that maybe don't even exist yet. Is that the sort of thing that you think could be done? I, I, I like the last thing you said about research fields, which didn't know they only existed, but it's it already happened what you said because uh, so so the categorical quantum for some weird reason the categorical quantum mechanics and one ingredient of it which is called the X calculus, which is like a calculus of spiders of two colors, uh, is now also being used in other fields like to 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 model electronic circuits and lots of other engineering applications. There is this new community. Which is called applied category theory. Also, John Bias. So, in a way, this was initially pushed by John Bias and myself. But the same, the same, the same kind of uh, structures as we used for quantum systems are now used in lots of engineering domains. They, and and they give completely new perspectives. Uh, and and this is only beginning. This is only beginning. Like a lot of the sort of teleportation-like things. There's now somebody, Jules Hedges, who's using all that stuff to model uh, game theory and get a new perspective on game theory. I mean, this takes a while to get something useful out, typically, because, because you have to, the way I think about it is, typically, one, one is in a domain like game theory, and then you look at what are the big problems of game theory, and then you ask, can this help me? Oh, no. But then suddenly, it sort of shows you a new door nobody had ever thought about. That that's That's where I think... Uh, such a radical new perspective comes in. But I also believe conceptually that, and I'm with Schrodinger there, that composing system is one of the most primitive things. Like, like we in Western science, we are obsessively, uh, obsessively obsessed with like uh, decomposing things in, 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 in smaller particles and stuff like that. It was always like that down. Like you take physics, what are the smaller particles? What are the smaller particles? This, this approach has been successful. But it's it's very one dimensional. Right, right. I mean, I mean, I mean, the best example there I would say is like, uh, do you want to understand how an animal, uh, what an animal is, whatever? Like, I mean, in, in the old days, anatomy was the way forward. You chop them open and you see what's inside, and you learn stuff. You actually see that an animal looks the same as us, and then you better close it because the church is not going to be happy. <laughs> 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 so, but. The real thing, which a person like Darwin, of course, did much later, is like look at animals, how they behave, how they interact with each other, and stuff. That's that's when it started, like uh, behavior, sort of more behavioral studies, and and that 
that by now is much more explanatory for why an animal looks different than another than chopping them open. The chopping them open didn't help much. Right. And understanding why an animal looks different than another. Looking at their behavior in the environment, yes, that does. And I mean, I want to, and for going back to language, for me, uh, lang- grammatical structure, if you trim it down a bit, because I don't think the way we, we understand grammar now is, 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 is in any way fundamental. Uh, that's another thing that I could say. But uh, grammatical structure in, in its fundamental representation is basically a logic of, of the world. It's the logic of like a prey hunting a, a predator hang, hunting a prey. And all the grammatical constructs we have, I can understand a sort of a, a, a logic of process of stuff out there. Yes. There's nothing special human about it. It's really the stuff which goes on in the world in some sort of process logic. That, that's for me what grammar is. When, when I say that it's actually too complicated the way it's presented is because uh, these structures are fundamentally two-dimensional. You want to represent them on a plane, not on a line. And since we humans are so poor and can just say one word after another, we force them on the line, and then a lot of the complications are just bureaucracy. And that's why word orderings are different in different languages and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've often wondered we what We made different choices. We made different choices. I, I've often wondered what you could do if, if somehow it were possible to um, transmit information in more richly connected conceptual units. So one, one of my favorite science fiction writers is Werner Vinge, and he's got the, the zones of thought novels like Fire Upon the Deep and A Deepness in the Sky. And uh, one of the alien races are actually, uh, they're, they're minds that emerge out of the interaction of what are basically wolves, right? So they're, on the, they're called tines and they're on a planet, but, but personalities come out when you get four or five of them together. And if you only have two, it's sort of like a baby and three is a little bit more complicated, but you get five or six, it's like a person. And sometimes you can get as many as eight, but they can all uh-huh. talk at once. All of them can talk at once. So when they speak, it's more like a chord, they're like they're playing a chord back and forth. And I, I've always thought that was kind of an interesting idea. Like, could you program a computer by playing chords to it? Would it understand what that conceptually represented? Uh, and I, I think with, with sort of the linear consciousness of a human being, it, it's real hard to play with those possibilities, but with something more advanced or more parallel, maybe you could do something with that. Yeah. I think it's it, it's indeed more like, I, I like the word chords. Yeah. Because it's indeed more like that. It's like the, the, way, the way, I mean, we typically, now, now I'm representing grammar more like circuits. So so you got like entities which get acted upon by, by whatever happens in the language. And then just like you put your finger on a few wires on your guitar, you put gates on a few wires, and right. that goes on and that goes on, and and you can represent all of the all of the structure of language like that. You lose some stuff, and what you lose, but what you lose is typically language dependent. Like, so you find some sort of a universal representation, which whatever language you speak, you always go there, but you lose stuff. You lose the the, the bureaucracy of the like like. There's no difference anymore between I love you and je t'aime. Yeah. yeah, the word order is uh, all, is gone. Te amo. Which is probably a good thing. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, th- this is absolutely fascinating. Uh, we, we will we'll have to continue this conversation at another time. But I really appreciate both of you coming and speaking with us. And these ideas, I, I think, are just remarkable. And I, I really look forward to getting more into them. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. All so right, well, uh, we, I'm having a beer. Constantine, do you have a beer? <laughs> <laughs> But it's evening. Yeah, it's evening here. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's two o'clock in the afternoon where I'm at. I think maybe maybe no, no beer for me right now. <laughs> you, you don't want to see. You don't want to see. Wait. <laughs> well, fantastic, guys. Thank you so much. Yeah. We really appreciate okay. it. Yes. Bye. 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 Thanks. Bye. Bye.